Rebecca Fowler from SciBite and is machine learning for scalable bioperation. Thank you, Jen. Um, so thank you. Thanks for inviting um, us to talk here, um, accepting our proposal. Um, and I'm going to talk about the, the role of the subject matter expert, so the role of the bio-curator in the machine learning process. And Kimberly set the scene for you know, how basically everyone's using it to scale up their curation to make it more efficient, um, get, the, get the extra information. So for those of you I haven't met yet, um, I've been working on ontologies and with ontologies for um, over 20 years now in model organisms and databases, healthcare, um, and now in a commercial setting. Um, so on the latter, I sit within the ontology team at SciBite. Um, for those of you who aren't familiar with SciBite, it was set up in 2011, and then we were acquired by Elsevier in 2020. And it was set up by a scientist, and the idea is it's for scientists. It's to help them manage their data, to query their data, to get meaningful information um, out of their data. And so in this talk, I'm going to talk um, a, a bit generally to start off with about machine learning in the life sciences, um, going on about the, you know, the importance of the bio-curator, where the bio-curator fits into that process, um, and then with a few examples of how we're using that at SciBite to scale up our curation. So this is how we see you know, machine learning fitting in, um, that it's covering supervised learning models um, with labelled data sets, unsupervised learning with unlabeled and reinforcement learning, you know, getting the, the, the right behaviour to get the, the maximum output out. Um, so essentially it's aiming to teach a machine to perform a specific task and to, um, you know, to get out accurate results at the end of that through the patterns that it's identified. And I think in life sciences, probably more so than in any other domain, um, I think you know, everyone would agree that we can't make rushed, um, misinformed decisions that could have um, dire consequences, especially for things like medicine and so on, where you've got patients at the heart of it. So rather, we need to look at the, the best evidence available um, and what inferences we're making from that. Um, and it's come up a lot in this conference already that it, it's not just the answer that you get out of it. You need to look at the evidence for that answer. It's relatively easy, you know, to go into uh, a chatbot and get an answer out. But then, you know, we want to know where the evidence for that is. Do we trust that evidence? Where are the identifiers? You know, how can we normalise um, and so on? Um, and, you know, depending on the evidence it's based on is how much we, we trust the answer that comes out. And then it's obviously got to be reproducible. If you run your algorithm over a data set, you need to be able to get the same or similar results um, when you run it at a separate time and ditto if a third party is um, running your code. And then human explainability. So what I mean by that is can a human understand the machine's decision that's led to that result? Does it make sense to us as a human? We obviously, you know, we can put things into context more. We don't work in black and white. And we can reason, we've got experience in life sciences domains, um, much broader, and we can help, um, we can help kind of critique, we can critique it. Um, and then there's compliance, obviously, if you're creating a, a product from your machine learning output, and there's data compliance, you need to be sure any third parties also comply, um, and so on. And this is the reason why that, that expertise, that subject matter expert, is so important in this process. And so, widely speaking, um, this is kind of highlighting experts in the tech area. You know, you have the data ops, um, you know, bringing the models to fruition, and then you have the productionizing of those. And on the right, it's a very simplified view of the, the, the machine learning process, starting with the, the messy data that needs to be cleaned, processed, trained, before you get the published model out at the end. Um, and what I'm trying to show is that these are all experts in, in the tech of machine learning. Um, but how do we go about assessing how accurate the results are, how relevant they are, and how, where, where the value of those in? And that's where the subject matter expert fits in, or the SME. So what I mean by the SME to this audience is essentially, a lot of the time, a bio-curator. Someone with experience in the life sciences, perhaps in a particular domain or a particular research area um, within a particular department. And there's multiple roles at which they're needed in this machine learning process. Um, so particularly important, especially for a commercial company like SciBite, is working out what models are meaningful. You know, working out, it's no point just throwing machine models um, in there for the sake of it. You've got to work out where they're going to add the value, where are they needed, where are the gaps. 
Um, and at Cybout, we work with customers, so SMEs in, in each of our customers, to identify those gaps and work out where we need to perhaps to scale um, and where the, machining le where the machine learning can add to our manual curation. And then it obviously goes without saying to this audience too that the, the training sets need to be high value. There is, there's no point putting messy data in. Um, and I know no, nobody likes data cleaning. It's not, it's not the fun job. Um, but you've got to ensure that your, your training set is free of bias and high quality to get the good results out. And then there's essentially the marking of the homework. You've got to validate the results out. It's not just like you put a data set in and you get a model out. There's various reiterations. You can identify the common pitfalls, things like negation, um, disambiguating common synonyms, um, context. Context is a huge thing. You know, we heard loads about that in the talk yesterday, um, about you know, synonyms um, used to mean completely different things, um, all dependent on the context. And it's easier for a human to critique that and to identify the patterns and where the machine learning models need improvement. So then you go through the reiteration and you mark it again. And then, obviously, there's not just one machine learning model out there. There's, um, there's various ones trained on different sets with different scopes. And as, our, um, as experts in the life sciences, we can understand the models that are coming out, and we can provide feedback on how those models are performing, um, again, with the, the evidence behind the decisions. So all of this is, you know, I'm not the first person to use human in the loop um, in this conference. So just to kind of reiterate the different steps um, at which the bio-curator is involved in the machine learning process, right before you even get to um, making the first model. So shifting slightly to move on to how we use the machine learning um, at SciByte in particular. Um, and we have a tool um, at SciByte, a named entity recognition tool. And we, what we, um, how we use that is that we, we create a set of vocabularies. So it is a public source available, and you know, we're, we're really lucky in the life sciences that there's this really high quality set of ontologies and taxonomies out there that we can use as our basis. And then we can apply our NER rules on top of that. We can add our curation, perhaps you know, identifying where things need to be case sensitive or setting the context or um, disambiguation uh, and so on. And so we create these set of vocabularies, and we've got over um, 170 of these at SciByte. Um, they cover domains from things like adverse events, phenotypes, diseases, um, gene names, um, drugs, um, and so on. And these are all hand-curated. We're lucky we've got a large curation team um, at SciByte. Um, we align them to in um, industry standards, and, and we make custom additions. We fill in gaps either adding in synonyms or um, adding in new entities where the, the term isn't there. Perhaps it doesn't quite fit the scope of what we need, for example. And what that allows you to do is take a body of text and pull out the, the key entities, the key bits of information that are important to you. And critically, it allows you to normalise them back um, to an identifier. We retain the source identifiers, um, obviously, so you can go back to the source, find out more information, um, we, it shows you that you know, APAP and paracetamol are, are talking about the same thing here. But you can see with the, the large number of vocabs we've got, we need to keep them up to date. There's source updates that we pull in, there's new domains that we go into, we make new vocabularies, we update the existing vocabularies. You know, we're, we're a team, all the curators are um, you know, highly trained in the life sciences. Um, and it, you can see that it's time consuming, um, that manual process. We, we, need to, we need to be able to scale that up. And additionally, you know, how do we know that we've got all the synonyms and the entities? How do we know that our coverage is complete? Um, you know, how do we fill in those gaps? So at SciByte, there's three main ways I'm going to talk about in today's talk about how we use machine learning in our curation process. Um, so the first of those is adding content to existing vocabularies. So some of the content vocabularies, you know, perform really well. You, you take your ontology list and it can effectively pick out the entities in, in whatever text you're running it over, clinical um, documents, internal documents, patents, and, and so on. But not all vocabs, even um, things like genetic variants, um, you know, there's so many different variations in the way that they're written. And we saw it earlier with code names, that it's really hard, even with rule-based vocabs, to, to be able to capture all that content. 
And then there's creating vocab from scratch. So most of our customers at SciBite um, are in the scientific domain, in the life sciences domain. Um, but we do do projects outside of that, um, things like engineering and laws. So when we need to make a bespoke custom vocabulary, there's not always a good source to base that on. How do we start a vocab completely from scratch and you know, know that it will have good coverage and that we're hitting the right, um, hitting the right entities and that we've, um, we've included everything we need to include? And then a third one I want to talk about is validating links between those concepts so you can make more meaningful queries, you know, that the, most of our vocabs don't work as just a standalone. They want, to, they want to combine the data. They want to look at the drugs um, and what indications those drugs have developed for, what the adverse events are from those drugs. So to be able to, you know, what the, what the targets are. Um, so pull all that information together. So on the existing vocabularies, um, we have several domains where, like I say, we've worked with customers um, to identify where the gaps are, where we need to improve our coverage, and um, some of the key things like genetic variants, the preclinical drugs. Um, we saw like the compound names, um, hugely varied. You can't pick it up um, no matter how many reg actors you've got. You know, you're going to be missing things. We want to trawl for new companies, new technologies, new drugs so that we can pass those on to our customers. Um, and these are kind of areas that we've identified where machine learning will, will really help here. And again, um, we're really lucky at SciBite that um, we've got a large ontology team, which isn't just by curators, it's by informaticians, data ops people. And so we work, with, we work closely with the machine learning engineers. Um, so how it works at SciBite is we, we have a regular fortnightly meeting, a, a curation kind of mini jamboree every fortnight where the machine learning model engineers bring their models to us and we validate them. And I think what's important here is that um, we work um, together so that we can reach a consensus. So we're all on the call, um, not just the bio-curators, but the bioinformaticians too. A lot of them have a background in the life sciences. And by doing it en masse, we can agree the rules that we're using to mark those... Um, to mark those models, and often there's more than one um, life scientist on the call marking them, so you can compare, you can compare, you can see where the pitfalls are, we can help identify them, and then they go and rerun the models, and then we can remark it um, in the next session, um, and we can agree on what rules we're using, when it's an adverse event, when it's an indication, and so on. And then there's building new vocab, so when we want to expand in a new area or there's no good public ontology or public source that we can use. So one of the um, models we use is the word to vec, a word embedded model. Um, and essentially words or phrases are, are given a vector. And those vectors are, um, they're chosen that they can semantically represent that term. So the closer in meaning terms are, um, the closer they appear um, within the vector graph. And from that um, word to vec, we have an internal um, model for generation of new vocabs. So how it works is that, first of all, you create your, your training set, so you feed in the words. For example, if I'm making a... If I want a, a skin um, phenotype um, vocab, I can feed in a number of high-level terms to, create, to pull in the terms, uh, to pull in the papers, the sources. Uh, it doesn't have to be um, papers. It could be internal documents or so on that I want to build that model from. So the first step is kind of collecting that data, the relevant data, um, to build the models. And then it pre-processes um, and trains those models. And then you can have um, a prediction step at the end where you add seed words um, and it will run those over your, your kind of wide training set. Um, and again, it's a, it's a series of iterations that you can put in different seed words um, to, get, to get out what it will do. It's, it will predict what content you might want to include in your vocabulary. And as you can see, you, know, you, need, the, you need the human involved in the process here to look through the list um, you know, the model isn't necessarily great at differentiating synonyms and antonyms or to know what is actually a useful entity. Again, you know, it's really hard to teach a machine what's useful, but from a human, you know, we've spoken to the customers, we speak to each other, we speak to the, um, you know, the programmers and so on. We have a much wider um, 
idea of what, what should be included. We can critique it. So the, the, the model's not doing everything here. Um, it's, it's doing a lot, and it's doing a lot of the bulk work, and it's taking a lot of the time for us. Um, and then we, we need to be there to, to constantly kind of validate um, and improve the process. And then the last point is um, validating those links. So, for example, these are just example sentences. And you can see the top one, it's easy to, to spot the, the drug and that the drug is being used for the indication. It's being used to treat bipolar disorder and that the adverse event um, from the drug is, is the weight gain and the tiredness. But the second sentence is harder. You know, the headache is getting worse. The headache itself, is that an indication or is it an adverse event? And you need to expand on that to say, you know, the, the headache is worsening is the adverse event or, or perhaps it's just the drug isn't working. Um, and that's why you need the kind of human in um, to be able to validate these. And what we do is, you know, we sit with the machine learning team and we mark them as correct or not and identify those common pitfalls. So to summarise, you know, we're there working with the machine learning engineers. So we've got a proof of concept approach at SciByte that will go out and apply to our vocabs so that we can scale them up, we can fill in those gaps, um, we can branch out into new domains, we can work out which models best fit our need and then um, add them to our SciByte tech stack so that we can pass those on to our customers. Um, so as ever, it's very much a team, team effort um, like I say, we're really lucky to have a large ontology team um, alongside machine learning experts, bioinformaticians, I've got life science experts, um, a professional services team where we talk to each other, we talk to our customers, we have professional services to help um, work out what the need is so that we're, we're really putting the resources into what's going to be most effective. And thank you very much for, for listening. Thank you very much for the really interesting talk. Um, I hear a lot about ontologies, but what I think is missing sometimes in a lot of these talks is um, how do you machine learn the structure of the ontology? How do you then standardize a relationship between terms, um, you know, parent, child, derived from, developed from? So, um, and also it looks like you are building a number of different ontologies for different subjects. Um, and how do those ontologies cross relationship with each other? Thank you. So, yeah, that's great. So, a lot of the time we're lucky, like I say, that we've got those public ontologies available. So, we incorporate um, the, the taxonomy in our vocabulary. So, for example, um, if you wanted to search, you, didn't, you don't have to search for a particular drug, you can search for a class of drug, um, for example, or a group of phenotypes or a group of diseases. So we use that in our vocabs for taxonomy. Um, and the approaches are highlighted just as some of the ones that we use for our vocabs. So the machine learning experts are kind of gathering data um, from data sets and then using those to query against um, existing ontologies so they can make more, more meaningful, um, get more meaningful models out of them. Hi, I'm just curious because obviously what you're making is a commercial product but you're starting in some cases with data sources that are public. I'm just wondering, is there still scope for you to feed back? So when you said you were adding synonyms and things, would you still, I'm thinking gene names and gene sim and symbols, would you give them back to us to improve the public resources as well? Or is that a slight conflict with the... No, the no not at all. So we do, and it's in our interest to feed back. Um, so we do, we're, you know, we've worked with quite a lot of people on these different ontologies. So, you know, we, we do feedback into the GitHub trackers or into, you know, direct feedback. Um, obviously, it's dependent on time. But if we spot mistakes, we feedback. Or if the ontology isn't loading correctly, you know, so that it's something that they can fix their end, then, then we feed those back. Um, so, obviously, you know, some of our curation is at IP. So, um, it, it, it's really the balance. But, yeah, but we do, we do work because, obviously, we're taking the public sources and, you know, those ones that are freely available to license. So, it is kind of... Um, two-way, to some degree. Thank you for the talk. Um, uh, Sylvia must take this seriously to buy you out. And does that put a value on the value of curation? And can that be used to argue for the funding for curation? 
I hope so. Um, I mean, <laughs> the fact that, you know, we have, what, six curators in our team? Six, seven? Our team is ten. Yeah, yeah, a whole team of ten, and there's plenty of work for us, um, <laughs> plenty of interesting work for us. Um, and I think it's, you know, a lot of our customers are aware that, especially things like, oh, I didn't fully answer the second part of um, Nancy's question about how we, you know, connect the two different um, vocabs, and, you know, we, we we do mappings, we take mappings from the public source um, and so on. And I think a lot of our customers are aware that we can't just throw things at them. The, there is a high level of manual work that goes on behind that and a high lot of work um, you know, to keep it up to date. You know, they want the latest Kemble release in their, in their drug vocab. They want the new genes from HGNC and so on. Um, so I think a lot of our customers, we work really closely with them or on calls with them. Um, so I think they're aware of the kind of the manual steps um, that go into the, the, the kind of whole process. Okay. So, I couldn't be here. The only issue is that the curators are only a subset. Okay, in the interest of time, thank you. So, um, then 